Hi class, I wanted to wrap up this week by giving a short talk about 72 letters. It's a tough work and there's a lot going on in it. So I wanted to emphasize some of the key ideas in the story and what I wanted you to take away from your reading of it. So part of what makes 72 letters such a tough story is that it has elements that aren't typical of science fiction. It is elements that are pseudoscientific or based on pre-scientific belief. It even has elements that we consider mystical or magical. I think some of the main elements we see are the amulets and the golems. These are introduced to us towards the beginning of the story. Our narrator says, nomenclature was undergoing something of a revolution during this time. There had long been two classes of names, those for animating a body and those functioning as amulets. Health amulets were worn as protection from injury or illness, while others rendered a house resistant to fire or a ship less likely to founder at sea. Of late, however, the distinction between these categories of names was becoming blurred with exciting results. So, in that passage, we have references to automata, which are very similar to the golem from Jewish law. So, I wanted to give you a bit of information about golems. I know I had you read an article on it, but this kind of sums up what they are. So, golems come from the Babylonian Talmud, and as some of you may know, the Talmud is basically a huge collection of Jewish scholarship. It covers law, ethics, philosophy, law, history, and so on. Within the Talmud, golems are automata that are made of clay, roughly shaped into human form, and they're often brought to life through rituals, which generally include use of the various names of God. And there are various ways these names may be used to give life to the golems. They may be inserted into their mouth, they may be inscribed onto their forehead, or they simply may be spoken. In 72 letters, all of the automata are built with neat little slots in the back of their heads where the names can be slid into. So it's making that process of creation mechanized, scientific, more efficient. So in addition to our golems, we also have amulets. And again, within the Jewish tradition, there's a contested belief in protective amulets. Um, some Jewish people still believe in protective amulets. They'll wear them, they'll have them around their homes. But in general, they've been done away with by reforms in the faith. However, there is a long tradition of them, and it's a tradition that continues into the present. In ancient times, these amulets were often inscribed with scriptures about health or protection. So scriptures that involved God blessing someone with health, or God protecting one of the prophets. In Kabbalah, which is a particular form of Jewish mysticism, you have amulets that are inscribed with combinations of divine names, much as is the case in 72 letters. You can see one of the amulets on the screen in front of you. You can actually go ahead, if you're interested, and buy that from Etsy. So they're available even today. So I think what's interesting about the use of names in golems and amulets is that it's much more typical of fantasy for names to give power. You can see it in The Wizard of Earthsea. You can see it in Miyazaki's Spirited Away. Um, as Earthsea says, a mage can only control what is near him, what he can name exactly and wholly. So naming something gives you power over it. Knowing something's true name means you can control it. And in general, I think, magic often consists of words that bring about a change in the natural world. Think about the Harry Potter series. Think about how he casts his spells. Yes, he needs the wand, he needs the intention, but he also has to speak a word, incendio, to cast fire, or lumos, to create light. 
So we have what are mystical, magical fantasy elements showing up in 72 letters. At the same time, we also have pre-scientific or pseudo-scientific beliefs. The most obvious one is pre-formationism, which was a popular theory of reproduction in the 17th and 18th centuries. And basically, what pre-formationism said is that organisms developed from tiny versions of themselves. So you have the theories of people like Nicolas Hartzucker, who argued that sperm contained tiny humans. You can see one of his sketches on the screen in front of you. You can see the head of the sperm, and then you can see the tiny person curled up inside it. Other people took this idea further. There was a person called Nicolas Malebranche, who argued that each embryo contained smaller embryos, like a Russian doll. This is the idea that Chiang is working with in his short story. It informs the central crisis of the story. Instead of each embryo containing an infinite number of other embryos, there's a limit to how many it contains. And humankind is reaching that limit. So it's going to go extinct within five generations unless he can figure out a way to solve it. But what makes 72 letters really unusual is that it combines this magic, this mysticism, this pseudoscience with theories that we'd consider recognizably scientific, that we'd even consider part of hard science. So it brings in ideas from industrial engineering, and it brings in ideas from thermodynamics. More than that, though, magic and mysticism is presented in a scientific way. Nomenclature is a science, subject to the scientific process, governed by scientific principles. So we have these fantasy elements being presented as the science of this world. What the heck is going on with that? It's weird, right? Well, I think there are two ways of thinking about it. One possible explanation for what's going on lies in the work's subgenre. It's steampunk. Now, BT talked about steampunk in the article I had you read, but I'm also going to put up a video from YouTube on our course site. Steampunk, as many of you may know, has a very specific aesthetic, and I want you to be able to see it. For the moment, though, steampunk is basically a genre that imagines a post-industrial revolution Victorian world that went in an alternative direction, and that brings together elements that we'd normally consider separate or discontiguous. It asks, what if? It requires us to ask, what if? So what Te Chiang is doing is imagining a world that went in an alternative direction, where the science went in another direction because the laws of nature are different. He imagines what a world would look like if the science was governed by magic, by mysticism, by pseudoscientific beliefs such as preformation. And in this way, he's asking us to bring together separate elements and see their continuity. Magic and science are not separate in this world. They're governed by the same principles. They're governed by the same processes. And we're asked to consider what the implications of that are. Another explanation, though, may be found if we think about science fiction in a more broad, expansive way. I really like Robert Schulz's definition for doing this. It's not the only one you can do it with, it's just my favorite. Anyway, Scholl says, fabulation, by which he basically means science fiction, is fiction that offers us a world clearly and radically discontinuous from the one we know, yet returns to confront that known world in some cognitive way. So what Charles is basically saying there is that science fiction is able to present us with worlds that are different from our own, maybe worlds that are governed by mysticism, magic, pseudoscience. However, by looking at those different worlds, 
it gives us a different perspective on our own world. It encourages us to see issues, problems, fears in our own society from a new perspective. And I think that's exactly what 72 Letters does. As a lot of you have pointed out in your responses, 72 Letters explores issues that are extremely relevant to us. Issues of automation, of mechanization, of AI, of cloning. It gives us a different perspective on them by locating them in this imaginary past. And so it gives us a fresh new way of thinking about them. So I hope this lecture was helpful. I'm not going to be doing these sort of wrap ups every week, but I did feel that 72 letters deserved a little more explanation than I gave it. So I will see you soon for Story of Your Life.